there, I've been told this is the time. So rather than have Leanne frantically waving and jumping up and down, I thought I would set the alarm. and We'll just see how far we go with all of that. Um, there is a reason that I am here on the day that I could have been at Murrayfield watching Scotland hammer England, um, which is going to happen, and we are going to win the Five Nations, and I am going to eat humble pie about 20 past six this evening uh, whilst I'm waiting in the airport. Um, the reason is not just that I love coming to Northern Ireland, which I do, I genuinely do, but it's because uh, I think this subject is the most important issue facing the church in Northern Ireland, in the UK as a whole, and it's the question of education. So much so that um, the magazine, I hadn't even realised we were giving it away free, but we apparently are, uh, <laughs> which is great. Um, I, I, we, did a, we started a new print magazine about nine months ago, and uh, that sounds really daft. You can also get it as a PDF file as well. And the third edition, the latest edition, is just all about education. And there are two or three articles in there which are absolutely brilliant. I think the others are good, but there are two that are uh, outstanding. They will demand that you do a little bit of thinking, but you're all remarkably intelligent people, so that won't be a problem uh, for you. So you can get a copy of that at the door. But we thought the subject was so important that we also did a complete, devoted one of our conferences uh, to it. So, uh, I want to kind of think about this and encourage you to think about it, and I also want to offer uh, an apology right from the beginning. Um, if I say anything that offends you, tough. Uh, it's, I, I don't, honestly, I never ever set out to offend people. I just think out loud as I'm going on, which is a very dangerous thing to do. But um, it is, what I'm intending to do is to provoke and to, to help you think through some of these issues. So let me begin by uh, giving you the, this is the, the basic idea of why this is so important. False ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer and yet succeed only in winning a straggler here and there. If we permit the whole collective thought of the nation of the world to be controlled by ideas which by the resistless force of logic prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. Under such circumstances, what God desires us to do is to destroy the obstacle at its root. What is the point of telling people to believe in Jesus if they don't know who Jesus is? Or if they don't know what faith is? Or if they don't know who God is? Or if they don't know how to think? You know, it, it's an astonishing thing that at the time of the Reformation, Education was considered to be absolutely essential. And yet I wonder how many of you come from churches today where education is considered to be essential. And yet it is what our children are learning, what's being taught in our universities, which is proving fundamentally destructive to the Christian faith. I was in a school class of 13, 14 year olds just over a week ago, 20. How many of you, I explained to them what atheist was, agnostic was, Theist was, Christian was. How many Christian? None. How many theists? One. How many agnostic? Three or four. Rest said they were atheists. Now, you'll forgive me saying this, but they couldn't think. They were dumbed down. They just kept sh chanting out mantras from the internet. There's no evidence. There's no evidence. Jesus didn't exist. There was, they were on their phones. They were rude. They were aggressive. You're going, okay, that's Scotland. What do you expect? Um, <laughs> But that's actually what happens when you move away, I think, from a Christian philosophy of education. Now, that was in a working class environment, in middle class environments, you just get it in a slightly more sophisticated form. And I've seen that happen many, many times. There is a battle going on in our schools just now. Our militant secularists are, uh, let me move this on, oops, sorry, back one. Is he? That's it. Now, would you want to do it? I still want to go back on Says he. Well, I'm going to put it that way. That's it. That's it. Leave that one there. Our militant secularists, who are really atheists, are using the myth of secular neutrality and the idea that all religions, including 
Christianity should be privatised to remove any remaining traces of Christianity from our traditional Christian education system. And by the way, one of the biggest mistakes that you will make in Northern Ireland is simply this. Thinking that if you've got school chaplains and you're allowed an SU group and you have an assembly where someone occasionally mentions the name of God and you get to sing If I Were a Butterfly, uh, that somehow we've still got Christianity in the schools. If you don't have a Christian worldview or a Christian ethos, you don't have Christianity in the schools. You have Christianity as some kind of hobby. So that SU is the equivalent, as it was in my school, to the chess club or the Trekkie Society or whatever. And that creates, as I said, phenomenal problems. The Dalai Lama came to Dundee and I went to hear him along with hundreds of pupils and teachers. And what struck me was not the fact that he sat there and giggled and a 16-year-old girl came to the front in front of 2,000 people and he said to her, you're fat. Now you'd imagine if an American televangelist had done that, it would have been all over the press, but because it was the Dalai Lama, not a word. There was a gasp of shock from the audience and that poor girl was so humiliated. But what intrigued me was not so much that, but I realized that the Buddhist system of morality is now the mainstream morality that's being taught in our schools. Why do we care about all of this, or why should we care? For me, it's not primarily about our children. I think sometimes when Christians talk about education, we're thinking it in terms of our own children, which is very, very important. I have three children grew up in the state education system. <laughs> but for me, it's more about, I'm concerned about evangelism. Not that you use schools to evangelize, but back to the quote of Greg Gresham Machen, which is that if, if people haven't been taught how to think, it's no point telling them what to think. And I think that's a, a key fundamental issue. In terms of my own children, I, you know, if your children are coming from a stable Christian home and they're being taught at home, and interestingly, I wonder if that's happening as well, and I wonder what they're being taught in church as well, because I sometimes fear that Sunday schools have just become babysitting classes for parents. But if they're being taught well, then in the, they, they should be able to cope in the state education system. I remember my daughter Becky at primary school. She came back from school one day and she said, Dad, I've got something to tell you. I said, what's wrong? She said, I got in trouble. I said, okay, I figured. Um, what did you do? She said, well, I'm not sure, but I got in trouble. I said, tell me what happened. Well, she said, the teacher told us that we had to think pink. And then we had to close our eyes and imagine that George Bush and Saddam Hussein, so it was a wee while ago, were uh, in a room together. And if we thought pink, then we'd bring peace to the world. So I said, so why did you get in trouble, Pet? She said, well, I closed my eyes. Uh-huh. And then what happened? Well, the teacher said, Becky, what do you see? Uh-huh. And I said, Miss... I don't see anything because my eyes are closed. <laughs> I said, that's my girl. <laughs> Common sense and logic. Good for you. And you may have got in trouble with the teacher, but you're not getting in trouble with me. I think we gravely underestimate the insidious indoctrination of our children that can occur in schools and the growing encouragement to hostility and mockery of Christianity. And don't say that doesn't happen or won't happen in Northern Ireland. Last time I was over here, I spoke at uh, Stormont Hotel, which was a very interesting meeting, about 400 people, the majority of whom were atheists, some of whom even travelled over from Scotland. To say that they were hostile is putting it mildly. Um, I, I don't think you do in-between in Northern Ireland, maybe that's wrong, but there was just, it was just... And I thought, where, where did all this come from? When I met with the kids in the school uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was astounded at the hatred and the hostility combined with the ignorance. Stonewall are paid large amounts by the government to campaign against homophobic bullying. <coughs> well, good for them. But even when I went to school many years ago and I became a Christian, I was mocked and I was bullied. My least favourite bit, by the way, of being in school was the school bus, for being a Bible basher. I know many children from Christian backgrounds 
who are mocked, sometimes by teachers, for their faith. And I don't see government-sponsored or funded campaigns against that either. But here, I think, is where we come into a kind of Christian view of education. I think in the absence of a coherent worldview, secular education is fragmenting knowledge. Unrelated bits of information give no basis to grasp a vision like Comenius's to change the world through education. The secular university knows no Messiah that promises a kingdom to the poor, the weak, and the sorrowing destitute. It's by a man called Vishnu Mangalwadi, and I really want to recommend his book called The Book That Made Your World. I don't think people realize just how much society, Western society, stems from Christianity. Now, you'll get Christians say this, of course, but many Christians don't understand in terms of the depth how much that comes from. So, for example, one of my favorite writers is the Chinese writer Wang Chun, who wrote about uh, Mao, who wrote the she's most famous, I think, for the book Wild Swans. But her latest book was about the Empress Dowager at the end of the 19th century. And the Empress Dowager was the most powerful figure, one of the most, certainly one of the most powerful women in the world, one of the most powerful figures in Chinese history. And she brought China into the 20th century. But she used a Northern Irishman, a Belfast boy, to do it, who ran her economy. But he went as a missionary, and that's what he did. He got the railways working, he got the economy working, and everything else. And I remember speaking to her and saying to her, asking her about the influence of uh, Christianity on China. And she said, well, in the 19th century, it changed China. But it didn't succeed in reaching the people. But in the 20th century, in the 21st century, it most certainly is reaching the people. I would argue that uh, the whole worldview that we have is hugely important. And if we are concerned with people, then we want people to hear about Jesus and we want people to see the impact that that has on the whole of society. I'm going to give you an example of a man called Thomas Guthrie, who was a uh, Scottish Presbyterian minister. That means he was a real one. <laughs> and then, and, uh, but a fascinating character, because from the 19th century, you see, there, there was never this dichotomy between helping the poor and preaching the gospel because they regarded them as the same. They didn't divide into social gospel and, and all the rest of it. And for Guthrie in particular, it was the whole question of schools. He set up something called the Ragged School Movement because he would walk in the poorest areas of town and he would realize that education was the best way to help people get out of poverty. Now, one of the things that's happening in Britain, although we use the mantra all the time of equality and diversity, the fact is, if you've got money, you make money. And if you've got money, you generally get a better education. You can either send your kids to a private school, or what you can do is pay 100,000 quid extra to buy a house in a good catchment area in some of our cities. And in a lot of our, uh, maybe this is not true for Northern Ireland, but it's certainly true for Scotland and much of England. In a, in a lot of our cities, kids are being brought up in sink housing estates, going to schools where teachers are just virtually babysitting, and they have got very little chance. Now, my own background was I was a farm worker's son, and I grew up in a Scotland, I'm probably the last generation that grew up with this, that they, what they called the lad of parts, the idea that we could, uh, well, no matter your background, you could go to university if you had the brains, but everyone had the right to have an education. My concern with education at the moment is the secularist view is education is becoming more and more about social engineering and preparing people for certain jobs suited to their class, ability, or whatever, rather than it is education just for the sake of education. I went to university to study history. Why? Did I want to be a history teacher? No thanks. Did I want to have any job to do with history? No thank you. Why did I go to university? I wanted an education. I was a farm worker's son and I liked history. But it's, I rarely meet students nowadays. Why are you in university? Because I want to become a. 
Well, I understand that if you're a medic, you know, it's probably a good idea to become a doctor at the end of it. But just to get education for the sake of education, that whole idea seems ludicrous to people. In fact, in our system, we're starting getting kids to specialize in shoes at ages 11 and 12, which is insane. You know, education for education's sake is actually a really, really good idea. So, Guthrie had some basic principles of education. I just want to list them really. Education is essential to save from ignorance, squalor, disease, idleness, and poverty. Ironically, these were the very things that Beveridge in his uh, report, 1944 report, enacted, of course, after the Second World War, and from which our whole welfare system is based. Really, education is absolutely the key for all of that. And it should be our concern, when we're talking about education from a Christian perspective, we're not talking about taking Christians and getting us all to live in communes, you know, we're all, and, and, and protecting our children from the world and keeping every bad thing out. Because if you think like that, your theology is appalling. Because the bad stuff is in your heart. It's not just the people out there. We're not creating a Christian cult. It's what's inside that is destructive to all of us. But our view of education is that we want people to learn, we want people to know, we want an opportunity to be given to everyone. Education should be for all, regardless of wealth. Guthrie struggled when he saw just how much the poor were not able to get education. And he describes a situation where he walked up to a, a, a child in a very... Uh, destitute state, and said to him, would you go to school if beside your learning you were to get breakfast, dinner, and supper there? Guthrie says, it would have done any man's heart good to have seen the flash of joy that broke from the eyes of one of these boys, the flush of pleasure on his cheek, as hearing of three sure meals a day, the boy leapt to his feet and exclaimed, aye, I will, sir, and I'll bring the hail land too. And then, as if afraid I might withdraw what seemed to him so large and magnificent an offer, he exclaimed, I'll come only for my dinner, sir. Now, in my city, we have schools that are offering breakfast clubs, because believe it or not, we've got children that are malnourished. <coughs> You've got schools, obviously, free dinners, uh, free lunches, and after-school clubs as well. And I'm looking at all of this, and I'm thinking... Where do we go as a church? How do we help people who are condemned almost from their birth because of where they live and the circumstances that they are in? And education is a key part of that. Education also should be based on Christian principles. And my secularist friends go absolutely mad with this. But that, I think, is hugely important. Above the door of Guthrie's Ragged Schools... <coughs> There was always an open Bible and the text, search the scriptures. There are Christian principles. Now, you see, a Christian education system is not one where when you're learning arithmetic, you go one, one God, two, two natures in Christ, three, the Trinity, four, the four gospels, five, the five books of Moses, so on. You can carry on like that. Right? That's not Christian education. Christian education is not learning lots of Bible stories. It's basic principles, because every school has an ethos, and every school has basic principles. I once went to a secondary school where the uh, headmaster said, boasted proudly, we have never had anyone speak in this school who believes in absolutes. To which the obvious retort was, absolutely? <laughs> but he thought it was just, that was just great. He thought that was just a wonderful thing. I was thinking, well, what, are they, what are these kids being taught? What is the background? What is the ethos? What are the principles? Another principle there is teaching is an honoured profession. It used to be in Scotland that there were three jobs you were greatly admired. If you were the minister, well, that's long gone. If you were uh, a doctor, and if you were a teacher. Where are teachers most honoured in the world? The answer is Finland. The answer is Finland. I find it quite bizarre 
that in our churches we will pray for missionaries who go to the ends of the world and we don't systematically and regularly pray for and support teachers. I think we should really need to encourage. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite intrigued that in my own congregation, we have anyone who's aged between 19 and 25 and they're female, if you go up to them and say, excuse me, are you from Northern Ireland and are you a medic? How do you know? Well, that's basically most of you. Um, but I'm, I'm amazed at how many Christians go into medicine, which is wonderful. We need Christians in medicine. But how many are encouraged to go into teaching? I think it's wonderful that people are, are called to be teachers. It's an honoured profession. Guthrie says this, What I desire in all our officials is sincere piety, a warm Christian affection for the souls of these poor children, a mind which will not be content with the perfunctory discharge of duty, not even with remarkable success in the way of improving their intellects and reforming their outward habits, but a mind and soul which burns with love to Christ and will be satisfied with nothing short of seeing these children converted and saved. There will always be secular opposition to, as Guthrie said, to his ragged schools, but to any concept of Christian schooling. I think that is because people realize that if you remove Christianity from schools, then you're going to bring up an atheistic society. In the uh, article that I wrote in this magazine, there's a quote from A.A. A. Hodge, the former principal of Princeton Seminary, who says this, The atheistic doctrine is gaining currency even among professed Christians and even among some bewildered Christian ministers that an education provided by the common government should be entirely emptied of all religious character. It is capable of exact demonstration that if every party in the state has the right of excluding from the public schools whatever he does not believe to be true, then he that believes most must give way to him that believes least. And then he that believes least must give way to him that believes absolutely nothing, no matter in how small a minority the atheists or the agnostics may be. It is self-evident that on this scheme, if it is consistently and persistently carried out in all parts of the country, the United States system of national popular education will become the most efficient and widespread instrument for the propagation of atheism which the world has ever seen. My atheist friends say that atheism is just the belief that, not the, the, just the belief that there is no God, but that we have to act like that until it's proven otherwise. If you run an education system like that, you're going to be bringing up children as atheists with all the consequences that come from that. Christian education as well deserves uh, state support. I think it's right for us to ask governments to support support. Now, that's not such a strange thing. You can have a Christian school in the Netherlands, which is kind of liberal and secular and all the rest of it. About a third of the schools are specifically Christian schools. You can do that in many, many other cultures. But here, it's perceived, in Scotland, our whole state education system was Christian, but now it's been taken over, and the whole idea of having uh, Christian state schools seems a strange one. I might come back to that in, in discussion later. Without Christianity, you will destroy education. Guthrie says, I hold it to be the greatest delusion that ever entered the brain of man to attack the management of a school and utterly shut out our religion. How are you going to teach morality? Every school must have a philosophy and an ethos. And we cannot just assume that it's going to be Christian because Northern Ireland is Christian. I have watched over the years Northern Ireland change very, very rapidly. And unless something drastic happens, you are going to be in a very similar situation to us within the next five years. And in Scotland, we have secularized faster than any nation in history over the past ten years. <coughs> this is from uh, Augustine. I love, uh, you learn, you can learn from the past. In the absence of a coherent worldview, sorry, uh, beg your pardon, here also is security for the welfare and uh, renown of a commonwealth. For no state is perfectly established and preserved otherwise than on the foundation and by the bond of faith and a firm concord, when the highest and truest common good, namely God, is loved by all, and men love each other in him without dissimulation, because they love one another for his sake, from whom they cannot disguise the real character of their love. That's what Christian education is actually about. It is about love. 
Michael Wadi says this, Britain gave universities to India to set us free. The West is now giving its youth myths that can only enslave them. This is ironic because it's the West's quest for truth that birthed science. People have a, 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 a view that uh, Christianity is opposed to science and all that kind of stuff. And no, wait a minute. See, the whole idea of the philosophy of Christian education is so that it promotes everything, so that it encourages everything. I think we are in danger of creating a system in the United Kingdom which will be fundamentally atheistic, secularistic, humanistic, and it will unwind what has, or untie what has for many, many centuries been uh, the foundation of our whole culture and society. So, There's a lot that you can read and a lot that you can think about in all of this. But I'll just summarize it this way before making some practical suggestions. No one, no education is neutral. The notion that you have a neutral secular education system is ridiculous. It's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. What we're looking for is an education system which is tolerant, really does encourage equality and diversity. Not just talk about it, but really does it. And I'm prepared to argue that Christianity, with its fundamental theology about all human beings being made in the image of God, with its notion of God as being love, and with the, the influence of the scriptures, is best suited to that. Now, others can argue for something else, and I think they have the right to have their children educated in that way. But what they do not have the right to do is to insist that every child in Northern Ireland or every child in Scotland is educated in a secular humanistic worldview. That's why it's important that we are involved in this. And here are some suggestions I just want to make. Um, obviously, first of all, we educate our own children at home and in the church. And that's a really important thing. I'm astonished at how dumbed down churches have become. You know, I, I, I'm, I remember when I was started in St. Peter's Church, there were seven people there, okay? Four of them left. It's what we call a Scottish revival. Uh, it's, it's just awful. And I started teaching the Bible. I remember people saying to me, oh, no, you can't do that because, you know, we've got to, first of all, you attract the kids in. You know how evangelical churches, let's get the kids in, let's have a kids club, and then we'll get the parents. That's absolute rubbish. You just end up babysitting people, or you end up brainwashing. You know, how many times, oh, we had 50 people come to Jesus last week. Why? Because kids put their hand up at a kid's Bible club. That's pathetic. What about the men? What about the mothers? What about the fathers? What about the whole society? And we need to educate our own children at home and church. And I'm astonished at how many kids, they just... They don't know, growing up in Christian homes. We've got students coming from Northern Ireland. And I say a big difference between now and 15 years ago is that the students are generally far less biblically literate. And also, they're far less worldly wise in many ways. They don't understand what's going on in the culture. And our churches are just not prepared to do that or, or really get stuck in to some of the difficult and some of the hard questions. So when I went to St. Peter, I said, I'm just going to teach the Bible and see what happens. But teach it in a contemporary context. I mean, no, 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 people won't come. Or that's just for academics, you're kidding. There's lots of academics I've met that are as thick as two short planks. And there are kids I've met from council house estates who are asking incredible questions. We need to educate our own children at home in the church. We need to be actively involved in schools. Of course we do. We need, you know, scripture union. Of course you've got to support that. We need to pray for our schools. Pray for our teachers. Parents, Christian parents, should be the ones who are actively involved, not say, that's the kids off to school, now we'll get a break. That's not what it's supposed to be. We need to resist the militant secularism who want to use the schools to indoctrinate their own philosophy and to exclude Christianity. We need, I think, to establish Christian schools for the poor. Not Christian schools, just for the Christian middle class. Now, you're, I know your education system is different from mine, and I know you're not as far down the road as, as we are. 
But we need to think about what's involved. My view in Scotland, as regards Scotland, if you go the same route, you're probably going to end up this way. My view is that the state education system in Scotland is now broken and irredeemably broken. And we need, some, we need a complete revolution. We need something completely different. Uh, I encourage teachers who are involved in the state system to remain involved. And parents, my own kids, all went through that. But more and more, I think we're going to have to adopt John Knox's maxim that where you have a church, there you have a school. Or at the very least, there you have an after school. The Muslims in my town, their kids go to the state school and then every day after school they go for two hours for education at the mosque. Imagine that in a Christian church. Why should children of wealthy parents be able to get tutors? Why don't churches offer them for free? We need, I think, um, I'm saying a Thomas Gatsby Foundation or something like that. We need, Christians need to put money in. Stop talking about things. Stop saying, oh yeah, go, we wish you well. Uh, if I had my way, I'd close half the churches in my denomination and uh, employ teachers. Maybe that's, maybe that's wrong. But we need to start thinking much more holistically and much bigger vision than we do at the moment. And we need, of course, to pray continually. Uh, I've suggested that already. Um, let me just finish by saying this. What does Jesus say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under their wings, but you were not willing. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them and blessed them. My city, which has a population of 150,000, the head of uh, child psychology, so my congregation, she told me that there are 1,500 children in care. And I said, that's a hot, dreadful number. And she said, yes, you're right. It is a dreadful number. It should actually be 3,000. But we can't afford it. We don't have homes for them. We don't have places to put them. It's 3,000 children in danger. So much in danger that they should be away from their natural parents. I did a kids club once where there were 20 kids and 19 out of the 20, you couldn't say to them, go home to your mum and dad. Because they didn't have a mum and dad at home. Maybe had one parent or who knows what. And I look at all the children, all of that's involved, and I see the behaviour. I'm going back to the school that I was in. And, you know, the language, the abuse, the stupidity, the dumb-downness, the, the hopelessness of it all. And it didn't make me feel angry at the kids. It made me feel angry at the culture which allows it. And angry at the church which doesn't seem to care about it. So I'm saying this to you. If you are a teacher, then God bless you. You have one of the most difficult jobs in this culture and in this country, you have one of the most important jobs. Why did I study at history at university and not science? I'll tell you why. Because my science teacher was mince and my history teacher was brilliant. And I loved my history teacher and she loved me. And, you know, let me do we lectures and things. And she's going to be so excited about history. You have such an influence as a teacher. That's such a wonderful thing. If you're a, a clergyman, if you're a leader in a church, you need to open your eyes and look beyond your immediate congregation. Who cares if your congregation is maintained? You are here for the kingdom of God. I want your congregation to grow and flourish and be greatly, greatly blessed. But not if it's just about you maintaining your 50, 100, 150, 250 people, whatever it is. It's to be salt and light in the whole world. And if we as churches are not interested in the children around us are not interested in the most important thing, which is education in a holistic Christian sense, then we do not deserve to be in the ministry and our churches deserve to die. And maybe you're coming from the Bible, maybe you're just talking, you know, you're a parent, you're wondering about your child. Well, the education they get at home is by far the most important education they will get. So, I mean, I'm sorry to quote Tony Blair, but education, education, education. That's it. Seriously, it is the biggest challenge we face, and that's what this conference is about, and I hope that you will benefit from it and think about it and be stimulated by it and be encouraged by it. The Lord has called us 
to this wonderful task. And here is something that will freak out everyone of the instant porridge generation. Of the fast food generation. You will so see now that may take 50 years before it brings forth fruit. But if you're sowing the seed of the word of God, it will always bring forth fruit. And in that, we should be encouraged. Thank you for your patience.